So here's what's going to happen. We're each going to um, present uh, to you in the order of Farah, Avis, I'll pop back, and then Sonia. And uh, then we're going to come up together and have a conversation. Um, so please welcome Professor Farah Griffin. I'm on the same panel with Avis and Sonia Sanchez. So, you know, I, I, nothing, things don't make me tremble, but that, that has me a little nervous. Um, and then following Maya and Ruby. Uh, I'll be quick here. Um, as a scholar, one of the things I learned early on, I think even before I became a scholar officially, as a graduate student, one of the things I learned early on was that it was almost impossible to, um, probably impossible, to choose any era in the history of this nation, even before it became a nation, where you could not find black women artists who were committed to some vision of freedom and justice. I'm almost certain that um, there was some creative black woman on that ship in 1619 who was already trying to figure her way out of that thing, um, seeing what was going to be awaiting us generations later. But we know, we know about these women, some of them, but too many of them are anonymous. And part of what I think Elizabeth and I do is not only to bring to your attention the famous ones, but also the ones who are a little less famous, or what all too often happens, the ones who were quite famous in a moment and then get lost to history. Uh, and part of our work is to make sure that they are remembered. Um, so I chose in this most recent work that I did, Elizabeth talked about it, the era of the 40s, because I realized there something about that period that produced an extraordinary generation of all kinds of people, ordinary citizens and musicians and artists um, who were actively engaged in creating a social movement that had similar goals to the ones that we often think of in the 1960s, particularly the early 60s, the period leading up to the March on Washington, for instance, but that much of the foundation of that movement happened in the 1940s, particularly around World War II. And I want to just talk about use the time I have to talk about one of them. Um, one of the three women who continues to inspire me, she was the one whose work I was most familiar with when I first began the project, is the novelist Anne Petrie. And the reason why I want to pick Anne Petrie is one, she was a woman born to, not to privilege, but certainly to a certain kind of class comfort. Um, she did not have to identify her struggle with the struggles of poor and working class black people. She chose to do so. She came from a family of entrepreneurs, of educators, of people who she, her aunt was the first um, pharmacist, black woman pharmacist in the nation, and she became a pharmacist as well. But she was a writer, and she had that hunger to create and to tell stories. And when she decided to begin telling stories, she decided to tell stories about ordinary, average Harlemites. And one of the reasons why I want to talk about her tonight is because I think that she gave us a lesson. If you look at the works that she wrote about during this period, um, starting in about 1938, uh, her first novel, The Street, is published in 1946. It's the first novel by an African-American woman to sell a million copies, to be a bestseller. But also her short stories. She gives us characters. They're populated. She gives the world of literature people who we all know, people who she saw on a daily basis as she walked the streets of Harlem as a newspaper reporter, first for the Amsterdam News and later for um, the People's Voice. And these people that she wrote about were ordinary, average African Americans, almost always working class, but always working, struggling, people of great dignity, um, people who defied stereotypes, um, people who didn't shout from the mountaintops uh, what their political beliefs were, or even who understood their beliefs as political. She didn't show them marching, and she didn't show them engaged in political struggle. She simply did this. She showed what they were up against. And I think the reason why she remains so important to me is that she taught us a lesson that I think we all need to think about even today. In her best-selling novel, The Street, she gives us a woman named Ludie, Ludie Johnson, who's a domestic worker, 
um, articulate, quite beautiful, single mother, married, but eventually um, is separated from her husband, trying to make a way out of no way for herself and her child, her son, Bub. She's trying to take exams to become a civil servant. Um, her idol, her role model, is Benjamin Franklin. She quotes his autobiography. She says, if I save a penny, you know, I'm going to have some money, and there's money to be made in this country, and she believes in this democracy. She is not a bigger Thomas from Native Son, right? She, what Petrie shows is that it's not about her behavior. Her behavior is just fine, right? Her behavior um, is everything that we are supposed to be and aspire to, right? Dignified. She's um, not sleeping with a lot of men. She's not sleeping with any men. She's turning down all kinds of offers and propositions, and she's constantly propositioned because she's a black woman. And what Petrie does is show that these behavioral um, you know, choices that she makes are all well and good, but that there are certain structures that she's up against. And that when Benjamin Franklin wrote his autobiography, he didn't have people like her in mind. And when the founding fathers created the country, they didn't have people like her in mind. And in fact, um, Petrie gives us a little name, something called the Junto. She names the white male character who owns the building where she works and owns the bar where she thinks she might, building where she lives and the bar where she might work. Petrie names, that the, names him the Junto. And Junto is the name of the secret society that Benjamin Franklin belonged to. Now, Petrie never says this in the novel, but Benjamin Franklin belonged to a secret society that helped him raise funds. It was a society that only white males could belong to, helped buy him out of his apprenticeship, helped to set him up in business. And slowly, all throughout the novel, Petrie shows us how Ludi is up against structures that are even invisible to herself. All of her fiction does this. She doesn't shout it out. She simply shows it, and she shows us the dignity and the humanity and the beauty of the characters, ordinary people who we walk by every day and the struggles that they are up against. So my one woman, because Elizabeth made me choose only one, and as I said, there's not a decade where you couldn't pick a whole generation of them, um, but my one woman, if I have to choose tonight, is Petrie, who was also a contemporary of Ruby Dee's and who acted in the American Negro Theater in the basement of the County Cullen Library with Ruby Dee and with um, uh, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier before they all became great names. This was, this was some generation. Um, and so I want us to think about Petrie, and then I want to close with one of her contemporaries. Um, and that is one of the other women in the book who is Pearl Primus. And I think that Pearl Primus and Anne Petrie leave us with a challenge that is as important today as it was yesterday or in 1943 when Primus said this. She says, in America's bosom, we have the roots of democracy, but the roots do not mean that there are leaves. The tree could easily grow bare. We." will never relax our war effort abroad, but we must fight at home with equal fierceness. This is an all-out war, and we will not stop fighting until everyone is free from inequality. That was the challenge that they took up themselves. It's the challenge that they leave with us today. Thank you. Um, this is a great segue. I'm Avis Robinson, and um, it's just really an honor to be here, and I'm really so pleased to be a part of this panel, and I thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, my interest and my talk is pretty much about a quarter century of collections and my effort and Eugene's effort to collect and preserve the artifacts about African American heritage throughout the world. What we've tried to do is explore African Americans' quest for equality throughout the colonial period and through the 20th century. And what we've tried to do is to create a collection of artifacts from slavery, the slavery era, era in particular 
slave ship logs, collars, shackles, manuscripts, maps, artworks, slave and contemporary black quilts and textiles, photographs, all of these things I've tried to collect to show the courage and the determination of our people. And when I say our people, I mean black people, Native American people, we're all a mixed society. It's poor people. So in my quest, in our quest to do this, in the particular in any area of arts, what we've done over the years is made an effort to collect African American arts from our hometowns, which is Orangeburg, South Carolina, and Washington, D.C. Um, we've, we've collected art from Eugene's um, relatives, Larry and Kara Walker, Leo Twiggs, Big Al Carter from Arlington, Virginia, who passed away three years ago, Michael Platt from DC, Margaret Humphrey, Arthur Rose from um, Orangeburg, and me. Um, <laughs> um, but all of it shows just who we are, and while most people think of me in terms of textiles and paints, I wanted to spend a little bit of time to talk about some of the images that you might see, that you'll see up there that may not fit, that you'll say, well, why is that there? And that is the things that will jar you, the images of slaves, the photographs of slaves taking the time, their last nickel, to have themselves photographed in the form of a, a tintype or daguerreotype. The, the quilts that they made out of scraps that they, they cobbled together, the little black dolls that they put together that they stuffed with hay or they stuffed with cotton, whatever they could find to make their little daughters happy. Those are the things that I'm most interested in and those are the art forms that I'm most interested in. So if I had to choose an artist that I'm most interested in, it would be this person that I discovered in May. I found a group of documents from Newburyport, Massachusetts. They were all crumbled up from the 1720s, 1777, and I found this document from 1773. Nancy Collins, my, my surname, my, my maiden name is Collins, from Newburyport in which they were taking her and putting her on Plum Island because she had smallpox. They inoculated, this, the colonists inoculated themselves, but they didn't inoculate the slaves. So when we got smallpox, they just put us on Plum Island to let us die. So I think about people like Nancy Collins, Negro Nancy Collins, and all the other Negroes that got smallpox during that period in January 5th, 1773 that I found that people don't talk about, that it's difficult for scholars to find. And I've taken those documents and Frank Mowry and I have worked and spent thousands of dollars to conserve 3,000 documents of African Americans that people didn't count in the census in the North that need to be saved because in the North, we weren't called slaves. We were called bondsmen and bondswomen. And what they did was they didn't count us in the census because we were the shadow economy. Sometimes it pays to be an artist and an economist. Because at the... <laughs> um, and so my life is pretty much dedicated to remembering those people that they didn't count. It's pretty much like today. We know Hispanics build our houses. We know that they raise our children. But we know they're illegal because they're a part of the shadow economy. And so, so we continue to perpetuate the poor laws that we established, or they established, in the 1740s today. 
And that's why I think it's very important for us to teach our children the history of America of the past. Because very much the poor laws of the past are pretty much what we are implementing today. And while we may say that it's not important, that it's the past and we need to forget about it, we should not. We should not forget Nancy Collins, who wasn't counted in the census. And we should not forget the people of today who are from Africa or wherever they are. They should be counted. They're in our society. They contribute. They built the colonial ships. They built the roads. They made the colonialist Revolutionary War shirts shoes, quilts, they made it all. I have all the documents that show that we made it all, but we did not count. Now, the image that I have out there of the slaves, most people think of the cotton gin, and that cotton gin is from the late 1790s, that is an Eli Whitney cotton gin should not be walked, you shouldn't walk by it because most people think of the Eli Whitney cotton gin as the Industrial Revolution, but most people don't remember that most slaves were in West Indies and that they were making the molasses that went to Newburyport where all the distillery were and they had the rum and off they go. So, what is important to me is to help you all, people, in through art, is to make the connection of economics. Whitney was from Newburyport, graduated from Harvard, went down to the plantation in Mulberry, Georgia, that was owned by Nathaniel Green from Massachusetts, and made that cotton gin to take those long seeds out. Brought in four million slaves from West Indies, that cotton went to Massachusetts to make that fabric that went to England. If I can show that simple fact by putting that cotton gin in front of the slaves in the field of cotton, then that's what we should do. If I can paint a picture of Nancy Collins in that poorhouse in Massachusetts, then I will. If I can paint a picture that makes people understand that the triangle trade wasn't triangular, but rectangular, and it was involved opium, and rum, and slaves in Massachusetts, then I will. That is what art is all about. We have to save the little black dolls that we made. We have to save the quilts that we made. We have to save the photographic images that the slaves took for themselves because photographs are art. Those dolls they made for the children are art. And so what I try to do was to take the artifacts, the old quilts that they made and put it on those women and put it on their dresses so that you'll remember that old quilt that someone made in the 1800s out of scraps because that's all they had. So that is what, to me, art is all about, black art is about mothers, poor houses, workhouses, farmhouses, soul, not being afraid like Maya Angelou, not being afraid and have somehow through their strength they'd have made us who we are today, to be fearless they were fearless, and somehow we made it through. Yeah.